Turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy 33. Oh, yes. Yes, we will dismiss all the little guys, eight and under. Deuteronomy 33 and verse 1. It says, And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And uh, we are down in verse 13. Verse 13, and it says, And of Joseph, he said, Blessed of the Lord be his land. For the precious things of heaven, for the dew and for the deep that couches beneath, and for the precious fruits brought forth by the sun, and for the precious things put forth by the moon, and for the chief things of the ancient mountains, and for the precious things of the lasting hills, and for the precious things of the earth and the fullness thereof, and for the goodwill of him that dwelt in the bush. Let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph, and upon the top of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. His glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth, and they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. Lord, thank you for these verses, and uh, Lord, thank you for what we've already heard about uh, Uranium City and all that's going on there. Lord, bless what uh, Brother Andreas is still trying to get accomplished here in the next few days. Bless their journey homeward. Father, we pray that you'd bless the camp this summer. We pray there'd be a real harvest, Lord, for you. And it would extend even far beyond the children, Lord. It would reach into those communities. And God, there would be everlasting fruit that would come out of it. God, help us as a church, Lord, to be prayerful and to be mindful, Lord, even now, Lord, as Andreas said, Lord, because that day of camp will soon be here. And um, God, bless his health, bless his family, bless Brother Foff and Mrs. Foff, Lord, and and all the people that are going to be a part of that. Now, Lord, help us as we look at these verses, and Lord, let them be alive to us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. The blessing of jo of Joseph. You know, um, in Genesis 49, you don't have to turn there. We, we may go there in a few minutes, but in Genesis 49, Jacob speaks his last words to his 12 sons. And Joseph at that moment in, in Genesis 49 is physically present there. And of course, in Genesis 49, Joseph is now the Lord of Egypt. He is second in command under Pharaoh. And um, Joseph's blessing from Jacob is the largest of all. And the same is true here. In this passage, the, the blessing of Joseph is five verses long. It is detailed. It is specific. Um, you know, one man of, of long ago said, in many ways, Joseph excelled his all his brethren. His brothers made him a slave, but God distinguished him from them by making him a prince. The blessing on the tribe of Joseph would be great plenty and great power. There was a massive blessing that fell on Joseph. Look at verse 13. And of Joseph, he said, blessed of the Lord be his land. You know, the land that would be given to Ephraim and Manasseh would be very fruitful even without that blessing. They were given some choice and some prime land. Yet Moses declares that that land that was good already would on top of that be watered with the blessing of God. And of course, the blessing of God is what makes all the difference and it changes everything in every place that it goes. The windows of heaven would be open there. The Lord says some things there. In verse 13, he said, Blessed of the Lord be his land for the precious things of heaven, for the dew, and for the deep that couches beneath. And it seems like that blessing is really aimed at, you know, the watering side of that land. You know, 
uh, overseas, that part of the world, um, you know, in our day is very barren and dry with the exception of a few places. But the Lord promised him that he would bless them with water. In verse 14, he says, and for the precious fruits brought forth by the sun and for the precious things put forth by the moon. You know, that's the that's the heat and that's the tides and that's the atmosphere. And, and God said, uh, you know, we want to bless him. We want to give them all that they need in every way. Verse 15, and for the chief things of the ancient mountains and for the precious things of the lasting hills. You know, he mentions the ancient mountains and and of course, that's a reference to something in the past. And then he talks about the lasting hills, and that's a reference to the future. You know, in these verses, there's a word that just keeps showing up, or, or a couple words. And one of the words is the word precious. He said, Lord, bless Joseph with the precious things. That shows up in verse 13. It shows up twice in verse 14. It shows up in verse 15, in verse 16. In verse 15, it says, give him the chief things. There would be things buried in the earth that would be his, in those mountains, the hidden things. There would be things reserved, heaven and earth and under the earth and the past and the future. That's quite a blessing. Quite a blessing. It'd really be wonderful if the Lord pulled you aside and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you all the precious things. Boy, you know, that varies for everybody. You know, there's some things. Precious means valuable. We talk about precious stones. And, you know, there's things that are precious to some of you that aren't precious to others. But everybody's got those things that are precious to you. And 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 uh, maybe you don't have some of those things. You've got your eye on some things that you'd really like to have. And, you know, they would mean all the world to you. God says, give Joseph the precious things. Give him the precious things. Verse 16. And for the precious things of the earth... And the fullness thereof, and for the goodwill of him that dwelt in the bush. You know, it's a strange phrase. And, and when I looked, uh, the only thing I could find uh, that anybody pointed to was Exodus chapter 3. In Exodus chapter 3, Moses on the backside of the desert. And, uh, you know, he comes along there. and He's been there for 40 years. And, and, um, and all of a sudden... He sees a bush that burns with fire and is not consumed. And uh, Moses said, I, I want to see what this is. And he drew near to that. And suddenly there comes a voice out of that bush. And it is the voice of God. And he says, I'm the God of Abraham uh, and, and Isaac and Jacob, the God of your fathers. And he says, take your shoes off. He says, you're on holy ground. And God speaks to him out of that bush. Out of that bush, Moses saw the kindness of God. Moses had wandered for 40 years on the backside of that desert. He thought his life was over. He got ahead of the Lord. He'd made a mess out of what God said would be, but he had taken it in his own hands. And you know, that's always what happens when you take it in your own hands. <laughs> it always just blows up in your face. And you know what? Moses had been back. 40 years is a long time. 40 years is a long time. And you know what? God hadn't forgot about Moses. And God hadn't forgot about his promise. And, and just like we said last week, God didn't throw Moses away. And the kindness of God speaks out of that bush. The kindness of the God that loved his fathers and the God that made promises. And it was out of the goodwill of God. It was out of the kindness. You know, in our Bible, it says repeatedly, there's this description of the Lord that shows up in four or five places. And one of the things it says about our God is he is full of compassion. He's full. You know, we say somebody's compassionate. Well, that's nice. And it really is a blessing. But it says the Lord is full of compassion. And he says, may Joseph and his tribe through the ages May they experience the goodwill of the God that spoke to Moses when it looked like life was over. He says, may he have the goodwill of the God in the bush. You know, in this list, you see a string of natural blessings. You know, he talks about 
the water and he talks about the sky and he talks about the moon and, and the mountains and, and it was material blessings. It was earthly blessings. But these natural things would be peculiarly blessed. They would be unusually blessed. You know, it's like the, the feeding of the 5,000. You know, um, the Lord shows up and and there's 5,000 men and the scripture is careful to say, not including women and children. So it was a big crowd. And um, the Lord says, uh, let's not send him away. Let's feed him. And Philip said, Lord, how, how are we going to do that? And, and Philip said, Lord, there is a lad here that has five loaves and two fishes. But what are they among so many? And it says the Lord took those five loaves of ordinary bread. And again, the Holy Ghost is careful to let you know these were not whales. Two small fishes. Two small fishes. And what did the Lord do with that? He blessed them. And man, when the Lord blessed that ordinary bread and a couple little fish, all of a sudden something unusual happened. And thousands were fed. And you know, that's what happens when God decides to bless. Your life might be really ordinary. And you you know, you might really feel like, well, you know, I'm just sort of an ordinary person, you know, and, and uh, you know, nothing great is going to be part of my world and you know i i'm i'm saved and i'm glad to be saved but you know i'm you know i'm, I'm never going to be much well you know um you know that all depends on if god decides to bless because you know what the lord delights to take ordinary things hidden things things with no talent and then he blesses them you know, when you read through these verses about his blessing, really, in a way, the Lord was saying to Joseph through Moses, he said, he said, let the hand of God be everywhere seen and everywhere felt in the tribe of Joseph. Look at verse this. These verses 13 through 16. There's no period. It's just a bunch of commas. It's just one continuous <coughs> list until you get to verse 16. And partway through the verse, all of a sudden the list stops and there's a colon. Verse 16, and for the precious things of the earth and fullness thereof and for the goodwill of him that dwelt in the bush. And then the list stops. Let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph and upon the top of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. You know, the Lord looked down and, you know, just like in, in every life, there's a zillion events that take place in anybody's life. But, but how often in the big picture, it seems like one event, you know, someday we're going to be at, at the judgment. And I don't know if God's going to let, let us hear, you know, other people's story as we're standing there. But if he did. One of the things that's going to be evident is that often it was one event that makes or breaks a life. It is one event that makes or breaks a life for or against God. How often it is one ongoing trial that really is going to define that life. You guys know Joseph's story. He was the youngest of J Jacob's sons. Jacob had 12 sons and he was the youngest. And you know that the tendency is to always spoil the youngest. And, and, and that is a bad tendency. And uh, it, you know, it didn't ruin Joseph. Normally it messes with the child. Okay. But it, it didn't really didn't mess up Joseph, but it sure messed up his brother's attitude towards him. And, you know, his dad obviously favored him you know, and, and made him that coat of many colors. And then in the midst of all this, Joseph has a couple dreams and those dreams are from the Lord. And that often happened in the Old Testament. And um, the dream basically said that someday he would be in a great position of authority and that his family would bow to him. 
And that didn't go over good with his brothers. Now, his dad, it didn't go over real good with his dad either, but, but his dad had enough sense to know, you know, maybe there's something to this. And it said Joseph just, or Jacob just sort of um, tucked it away in his mind. So Joseph's brothers are away from home and they're doing some work for their dad and they've been gone for a while. And then Jacob sends Joseph to check on his brethren. They see him coming. And you know, the, the Bible always just tells it just like it is. You, you can just sense the attitude, even as you read it. I mean, they said, behold, here, this dreamer cometh. And they just had no use for him whatsoever. And uh, literally, they had no use for him because immediately the next conversation that they're having is, as they see him coming, is, you know what? We could kill him. And they're not joking. You know, if, if, if somebody says, Oh man, I wanted to kill so and so. Well, we we all chuckle and we all go, oh yeah, you know we understand, you know. But we're not literally thinking of you know you taking them outside somewhere and pulling a shotgun and blowing a couple holes in them, and you know we all understand it's just a a a, a, ma a matter of speech. But you know these guys, it was not a matter of speech. They said, you know, we could kill him and we'd be done with all this, and that rascal who gets all the favor of our dad. You know, and his dreams, and you know what, what? Let's just let's just kill him. And Reuben steps up and says, "Oh, oh, guys, let's not kill him." He said, "Let's let's just throw him in this pit. There's a pit over here, and we'll 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 just let him sit in the heat of the day in this pit, and that'll that'll cool his jets a little bit. Let's just throw him in the pit." Reuben gets busy and goes off somewhere. And all of a sudden, the brothers see a company of Ishmaelites that are moving down the road. And um, they, they have this discussion. They said, you know what? Yeah, let's not kill him. Let's just sell him into slavery. Aren't you glad that your relatives are not like that? You know, we complain about our relatives, and rightly so. But, you know, none of you have relatives like that. Either that or you escaped. <laughs> and they literally sold him into slavery. Sold him into slavery. They didn't hire him out for a day or a week. They didn't say, take this rascal away for a week and work him to death and, you know, like hard labor. And then, you know, then we're going to have a talk with him. No. They said, we want him gone forever. You know, these little, well, we're going to take him to him. We don't care. He's yours. You need, you need some slaves, don't you? And Joseph goes into slavery. Why, it's a big thing even in our world. You hear a lot about it, you know, and, and by God's grace, it hasn't touched anybody in this church. But, you know, you hear about child trafficking and you hear about, you know, uh, the days of slavery are not gone. And he sold into slavery. And you know what happens at that moment? He is, and here it is, he is separated from his brethren. They're, they're done with him. They're not going to see him again. They could care less. And God says, this is the pivotal point. This is going to make or break his life. He winds up in Potiphar's house. And uh, boy, everywhere Joseph goes, Joseph, he loved the Lord and he kept his heart right with the Lord. And, and boy, it's not long. And even in Potiphar's house, he goes from being a newly hired slave to, you know, he starts to get move up through the ranks. And after a while, he's managing Potiphar's whole household. And Joseph must have been pretty good looking. Must have been strong, had, you know, attractive. And, and Potiphar's wife decides, I like this guy. She tries to seduce him. She tries to seduce him repeatedly. And Joseph refuses and refuses and refuses. And there came that fateful day when she grabbed a hold of him and he ran for it. And uh, she, she had, you know, half his clothes in, in her hand when he ran off. And... Um, and so she goes, oh, I'll, I'll fix him. And he comes home and she says, Potiphar, she said, look what your Hebrew slave. He came in, 
you know, and being the being the wonderful woman she was, she said he tried to rape me. So now he's lied about, he's accused, he's slandered, and now he goes to prison. But there again, God begins to bless and God begins to protect him. And, and, and somehow, you know, he, he begins to gain ground. And next thing you know, that the guy that's in charge of the prison puts Joseph in charge of the prison. Now, Joseph's still in prison, but now he's managing the prison. But years are passing. One day, Pharaoh's uh, baker and butler get thrown in jail and and uh, they're in there for a little while, and and they have these this dream, you know, and they they knew that these this dream that each one of them had had, uh, they just had that feeling that it was really significant. And Joseph said, "Well, well, tell me your dream." And uh, so th they tell him the dream, and 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 God gives Joseph the interpretation of that dream, and sure as the world it comes to pass. And of course, one of those guys the the dream was about how he would lose his life, how Pharaoh would put him to death. But the other guy was going to be restored to his position. And um, Joseph says to him, he says, you know, he says, you're when you get your job back. He said, would you uh, would you remember me and would you say something? Would you get me out of here? And you know what happens? That guy gets his position back and and he forgot. So Joseph is forgotten for two more years. And then Pharaoh has a dream. And Pharaoh is troubled by this dream. And, and he's trying to get somebody to interpret that dream. And then the guy remembers. And he said, oh, yeah. He said, I, I remember when I was in prison, there was a Hebrew guy there named Joseph. And he could interpret dreams. And next thing you know, Pharaoh calls him out. With haste, Joseph interprets the dream. And uh, in the next few minutes, Joseph gets promoted to the second man in the kingdom. So he goes from the prison to the palace. And man, what a, what a shift. What a, what, a, what a change. But in the midst of all this, Joseph had been separated from his brethren. You know, Joseph did not seek that. Joseph wasn't, you know, he didn't go to uh, to Egypt. He didn't go to Potiphar's house. He didn't go to Pharaoh's house thinking, you know, I want to get away from my brothers. They're giving me a hard time. He didn't seek it. He didn't want it. And he didn't bring it on himself. You know, some people get isolated from other people. And um, and sometimes they, they wanted that. Sometimes, um, sometimes they brought it on themselves. But that's not what Joseph did. Joseph didn't bring it on himself so he could be a martyr or a hero. But because of what some people had done, he was separated from his brethren. You know, psychology would have a, um, a heyday with Joseph. Um, you know, he was mistreated. You know, um, boy, oh boy, you know, I, I don't know the percentage, you know, but, but you know, you know how much of the internet and the blogs and the, and, and, you know, the, all these things that have arisen in our society, and, and I'm not saying they're all bad, and I'm not saying there's never a need for this. So so don't, but but I am making a statement. You know, you, you go all over the place and here's so-and-so psychology office and over here somebody's counseling office and here's somebody's psychology office. And, and Do you know why all those places exist? Well, for some, it's because their whole world was shattered because they were mistreated. Boy, psychology would have had a heyday with Joseph. He was mistreated. Boy, you talk about somebody that should have had a, a, a rejection complex. He was sold. He was despised. He was hated. He was imprisoned. He was forgotten. And for years... And how many years? You know, the Bible tells us how many years that Joseph was uh, from the day he was sold. He was 17 when they sold him. And the day that he wound up being exalted in Pharaoh's palace, he was 30. 13 years it went by. 
Boy, that's some of the best years of your life if you're a young man. 13 years. I don't know if Joseph would make it in today's society. Or would he? They that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. You know, if, if, if Joseph lived today, he would have to ignore all the psychological alibis that should have made him a basket case or should have made him shift his blame or should have made him mad at God or should have made him throw out this God thing and all his promises because his godly brethren devastated his existence. That's what should have happened. That's what happened if you lived today. But you know, Joseph wasn't, uh, it wasn't like that. By faith, it says in Hebrews 11, Joseph, by faith. You know, there's, there's just, um, can I say it? There is just no excuse. And if you don't believe it now, you will someday. There is no excuse from walking away from God because of your bad deal. You're going to stand beside Joseph someday. Oh, and you're going to whine to God about your little deal. I'd like to, I'd like to see that one. We had a, we had a, um, a few people um, that left our church a couple years back. And, um, and you know what? I still love them and I still pray for them. And I really do. And, um, but I just want to illustrate something. They left and, and, uh, and nothing really big and bad had happened, but they had just decided that they didn't believe a whole, I mean, I, I, I'm not exaggerating. They just decided one day that they literally didn't hardly believe anything we believed, including some stuff that revolved around salvation. And, you know, I went to visit them and talked to them, you know, and tried to reason with them, spent an hour and a half on the phone one day and, and then another hour on the phone another day. You know, I did all that stuff that, that you know, most people never know about. And I, I did all that stuff and, and you know, they were gone. And um, so several months go by and one of our guys ran across one of them and, um, and he said, hey, let's, let's do coffee. And, uh, and they said, great, you know. So our guy that's, that still attended the church, and um, he's a good guy, still a good guy. He just, he just moved. Bro Brother James Wolf, a lot of you guys remember Brother James. He went out for coffee with this guy, and James' thought was, you know what? I'm going to try to be a help to him. I'm going to try to reason with him. So it was him and this guy, and they got talking. And all of a sudden, <laughs> this guy says, Capital City Baptist Church, it's ruined our life. <laughs> Did we rob them? No. Did we get them to invest money on some fly-by-night scheme? No, I know where that's at. We didn't do that. Did anybody mess with their kids? No. Did anybody scream at them? No. You know what happened? Somebody disagreed with them and somebody called them out on their loose living. Man, if that's what ruins your life, that's pretty pathetic. If you want to see what usually ruins a life, take a look at Joseph. Do you understand why one day when it was all done, the God of heaven said, I'm going to bless all the sons of Jacob. But man, am I going to bless Joseph. Makes sense, doesn't it? By faith, Joseph, it says in Hebrews 11. And others, the Bible said in Hebrews 11, had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. Oh, he knew what that was all about. You know, as you read through your Bible, every once in a while, you'll come across something that the Lord doesn't tell you in another place. And um, in Psalm 105, there's just this one little verse, two little verses about Joseph. And it's God says, I sent Joseph before the people. And, and it says this about Joseph, whose feet they hurt with fetters. 
he was laid in iron. You know, I wonder if until the day's day of Joseph's death, I, I you know, there's something that occurred that the Holy Ghost said they hurt his feet. I wonder if Joseph lived the rest of his life. I wonder if his feet were scarred because, you know, they didn't have antibiotics back then and they didn't get. See, they were prisoners and you treated prisoners like dirt. And the prison, I, can you imagine if his feet got all infected? Oh, you know, they call the doc. Oh, what's the doc going to do? And he lived through it. And the Holy Ghost said, oh, I want, I want to tell you, they hurt his feet. If, if all the rest wasn't enough, they hurt his feet. By faith, Joseph. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. How did Joseph make it? Keep your place there and look at Genesis 49. Genesis 49. Even in Genesis 49, the blessing that is given to Joseph is amazing. And it's in some parts of it are almost verbatim. What Moses says in Deuteronomy 33. How did Joseph make it? Genesis 49, verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough. A bough is like, a, you know, you got a tree coming up, you know, and, um, and, you know, on every tree, especially at the base, you'll have these big whopper limbs that come off, and then all the branches come off that. That, that big, huge thing that comes off, that's, that's a bough, okay? It says, Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the wall. He is fruitful, it says, by a well. You know, uh, Andreas mentioned it, Psalm 1, and um, it talks, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. which bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And, and boy, it's the story of Joseph's life, whether it was the prison, whether it was Potiphar's house, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You know, the only way you can explain this is Joseph had an inner life with God. And man, he, he, had, he, he was a fruitful bough by a well. Well, you see the tree... And, and, and the tree's doing well. And why is it? Because there's some roots down there and they're tapped into that water level whose branches run over the wall. He said, you know, they, they tried to wall Joseph in, but there was no wall and no barrier and no prison cell that would stop his faithfulness. He'd go over the wall. Let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph and upon the top of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. You know, Joseph recognized the hand of God. God's plan for him was not a straight line. You know, uh, Joseph was going to wind up on the throne. And even though Joseph didn't understand, you know, the dream was just a dream that alluded to something of, of him being on top. It, it, it wasn't a dream about being in, in Pharaoh's household and being second in command. It was a dream. One of those dreams was that his mom and his dad and his brethren would bow to him. That was the dream. You know, um, but it sure wasn't going to be a straight line there. Whether you look at David or Paul or John the Apostle or Abraham or Daniel or Job or John the Baptist, there were similarities in their lives. And they loved and they served the same Lord. But how different the circumstances of their life. How different the obstacles, the tests. How different their growing up years. And how different the way it ended up.
We sing that song, God leads his dear children along. And the chorus says, some through the water and some through the flood and some through the fire, but all through the blood. And you know what it appears? It appears that there was no murmuring throughout those years. You say, how can you say that? Well, have you ever noticed how the Lord just has a way of revealing people's hearts and attitudes as he tells their story? Like the Lord never, never hides the ugly. You know, uh, we've often commented when you're reading um, a biography about somebody, uh, you know, you know, a lot of the, the rougher details of their life are sort of left out. You know, if they had something that really was a problem, if they had a bad habit, if they, you know, you know, a lot of times out just, you know, people don't say much about that because they, they want to, you know, recognize the, the, the greatness of this man or this woman. But the Lord never does that. You know, the Lord, the Lord just lays it right out there. He talks about the thoughts of the Pharisees' hearts. He talks about David as he comes in from dancing in the street. And it says, and Michael looked out the window and she despised him in her heart. God wasn't afraid to tell you that. You know, if somebody was crooked, God's not going to lead you on and make you think they're okay. You know what you never read about Joseph? That he murmured. Joseph is one of the greatest types of Jesus Christ in the Bible. It says of our Lord, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. You know, I, I look at this and I go, is it any wonder that God said, I want to bless him? from sea to sea and from age to age and with every precious thing imaginable because he never had a bitter word to say about what I did in his life. Amen. You know, the Lord tells us, and you know, we're all a mess. We all are. And the Lord tells us, do all things without murmurings and disputings. He said, neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. You know, with God, that's just not a little thing. He was separated from his brethren. You know, uh, the, the baptism of fire for Joseph was isolation, but it wasn't it wasn't solitary confinement. It was the kind of isolation where there were always people, but not the people you would choose. He was separated from his brethren and God watches the whole thing. And he watches Joseph and he watches his brothers. And even from the very beginning, God begins to work. And there's that old song that says, standing somewhere in the shadows, you'll see Jesus. And boy, I'm sure there were days when he wondered where God was and it wasn't easy and I'm sure he wasn't always whistling and I'm sure it wasn't pain free. But he recognized God. I sure don't know what this is about. This sure doesn't match that dream I had a long time ago. Lord, maybe that dream was like, you know, all those other dreams. It must have, it must have not been from you. And God, God was saying, oh, Joseph, just hang in there a little bit longer, son. Just hang in there a little bit longer. God watches Joseph and God watches his brethren. And a blessing is prepared for Joseph's head and for his gener. A blessing is for a blessing was being a throne, a seat on a throne was being prepared for him. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Man, it may be a rough ride, but if you'll trust him, well, there's a big payday coming. 
And and Joseph's payday wasn't, I, I'm sure he had a big one in heaven, but he got a big one long before heaven. You've heard the saying, God gives his best to those who leave the choice with him. Maybe we could change that a little bit this morning. You know, Joseph winds up with the best. God says, well, it's blessing time. You know, blessing time comes. It really does. Someday it comes. And God says, it's blessing time. Man, I want to give him the best of heaven and the best of earth and the best of time and the best of everything. God gives his best. God gives his best to those who leave the path with him. Would you leave the path with him? In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Man, he'll take you down some paths you wouldn't choose. But when it's all said and done, does anybody ever come to the end of God's path and say, Lord, I wish you hadn't have taken me there? God gives his best to those who leave the people with him. You got some people in your life. You, you love the Lord. You're living for the Lord. You're trying to go forward. You got some people that are driving you crazy. You got some people that are stressing you out. You got some people that are creating black clouds. You got some people that are pulling against you. Could you, could you leave the people with him? God gives his best to those who leave the clock with him. Oh, is there anything that's so frustrating as God's clock? Doesn't it drive you crazy sometimes? Doesn't it? I mean, sometimes it just drives you out of your mind. But they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God gives his best to those that leave the clock with him. God gives his best to those that leave the comfort with him. You know what? You know, uh, with the day they sold him into slavery, he was in chains. I, 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 I've never heard, you can go on Amazon, maybe you'll find a pair of comfortable chains, but I don't think they exist. I don't think they exist. <laughs> then he winds up in the prison for God knows how many years. You know, uh, there's, there's nothing, and especially in that day, there's nothing comfortable about a prison. Nothing. But you know what? God, God had a cushy chair for him. Oh, God, did God have a chair for him? But he just had to leave the comfort with God for a little while. See, sometimes I just feel like I am separated from my brethren. You know what? The greatest blessing, one of the greatest blessings of the whole Bible was given to a man that said, Lord, I'm, I'm sure he was honest. I'm sure he said, oh, Lord, I don't like this. Oh, Lord, this hurts my heart. Oh, Lord, this makes me weep. But, oh, dear God, just guide my path. And God said, do I have a blessing for you? You looking for a blessing? Let's pray. Would you let God choose your gang? You know, I, 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 God gives his best to those who leave all those choices with him. Lord, help us this morning. Lord, you're a good God. Lord, the good will, the good will of him that dwelt in the bush. Lord, you have no desire to hurt anyone in this room. 
God, would you help us to trust you with everything, Lord, in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if God has spoken to you, why don't you talk to him this morning? God, thank you for the precious truth of these verses, Lord. And thank you, Lord, for how kind you are, Lord, to your people, how you love your people. And Lord, how someday you're going to turn the tables and it's going to be OK. Lord, bless your people. Help them this morning. Some may be wrestling, Lord, with whether to trust you. Lord, help them, Lord, to make that everlasting decision to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.